I invite you to stand for the reading of God's Word. We finished our Summer of Psalms series last week. Uh, thank you all for giving me an opportunity to, to, to rest and, and be away. I had a great trip in, in New York. Um, for some, that's like, we, some people have said, you either love or hate New York, right? Some look at it and go, why would you go there? And others are like, man, I really want to go. Well, we had a wonderful trip, so I appreciate uh, you all allowing me and my family to do that. Um, and I trust that uh, Jeff Guinan uh, pro proclaimed to you the Word of God in a powerful and amazing way. Hear now the reading of God's Word from Matthew chapter 3. We are moving into a, a series that's going to walk through and give like a, not an overview of the Gospels, but walk through the Gospels and apply some of the teachings of the Gospels to what's going on today in our lives. Um, and and, and the, the title of the series is The Gospels, Ancient Yet Relevant. Because I want us to understand that the Gospels, not just the four Gospels, but primarily the Gospels in this context, are not these old stories for people long ago. And, and I know we all know that. I'm not saying that you guys didn't understand this, but I want to remind us of this. I want us to see this. I want, I want to dig in and study that and go, yeah, yeah, all that Christ did, all that Christ said was truly um, relevant and is relevant to my life today. Here now, the reading of God's Word from Matthew chapter 3. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. This is the reading of the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, we do thank you for your word. Don't let us be like people that look in a mirror and walk away and forget what we've seen, God. Let us hear the truth today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated. The Gospels, ancient yet relevant. I'm going to give you a definition of these later, but I want this to stick with you the way I'm using the words. The word ancient here has this connotation not just of old, but of lasting. It, it, has, it was given long ago, and its impact and its truth is still relevant. There's another word we use, antiquated, uh, and, and I didn't do a huge deep dive into these words, but on their surface, my idea of antiquated is just old-fashioned. It's kind of out there, old, not to be dealt with. The Gospels are not antiquated in that context. They are ancient, meaning wisdom from on high, given many, many, many years ago, still relevant today. And as we look at Matthew 3, I want us to understand something that we, we grasp and glean from this. And this may, the Gospels are progressive. And you're like, wait a minute. Progressive is a bad word, right? Progressive Christianity and all of these things. And obviously I chose that word to kind of waken us a little bit to realize that some people commandeer words and make them negative. Um, there is a negative connotation to being continually progressive and always trying to change things when you're changing the good stuff into the bad stuff. But I want us to, that's what we're going to look at today is the progressiveness of the gospel and how it fits into our lives today. So we live in an age that is accelerated. The accelerated change is truly transforming human society. Jobs are being eliminated by machines. There's been a revolution in travel, a revolution in communication and that's taken place. The rate of change is, is so rapid that individuals are struggling to keep up. Not only that, social systems are struggling to keep up. 
Personal relationships are degrading. Consumerism has really taken over. All of those things sound true of today, but they were statements about the 18th century industrial revolution. As you go back and research, and research, I looked up on the web some things people said about it, full transparency. I have knowledge of it, but I was remembering, like what, trying try to pull it back up. Um, but these are statements of, of things, people, historians looking back, going, this is what was going on. It was an upheaval of society. We're in the midst of that today. And what we've got to recognize if we're going to walk through the upheaval of our societies, we've got to realize that our struggles are not new. 18th century industrial revolution. We look at people in the 18th century and go, oh, weren't they cute? They dressed up. They walked on dirt roads. They were just not quite as with it and and intellectual as we are. (laughs) They all knew 14 languages. They were probably much more intelligent than we are. No, but in, but in all seriousness, education has increased. A, a lot of things have progressed, but the problems we face seem to continually come up throughout the ages. One, one writer said, imagine what it was like when everybody went from being nomads to settling down and planting farms. You know, people were like, well, this is what we do. How do I live sitting and being agrarian? Like there's a constant change in society. And Ecclesiastes sums it up well. What's been, what has been is what will be. What has been done is what will be done. There's nothing new under the sun. There's nothing new under the sun. Today, as you read about the Industrial Revolution, people, uh, many people are saying we're actually in the fourth Industrial Revolution today. Uh, I was talking with various people over the last few months, and there's this realization that what is and what we're walking through is, is such a huge transformation. And really, in the context of all of history, two to three hundred years, it's not that long. So what began in the Industrial Revolution has continued as each generation of technology and all of these things have increased. We are about to see some vast transformations even in how we what we think communication today is, is fantastic and amazing. It's about to just take off in ways that we've never understood. That like When I had one job where we were trying to predict when people would join a membership to certain uh, groups that we worked with, and we always knew that the real holy grail there was to not predict these things, but to be able to influence these people to make this decision. And there was a full belief that that can be done through data. That if you have enough data about people that you can influence their decisions and change how they think, function, and act. And we know it's true. We're watching it happen. And so what I would like for us to understand, though, is that the core problems are all the same. Now, the how they show themselves, I, I don't want to I don't want to kind of downplay too much that we're in a totally different world than they were in the 18th century, 19th century. But degrading of relationships, growing into my own personal desires and fulfilling my desires above all things, this pursuit of progress among people never ceases. Society continually progresses forward. It it is not human nature. When you think about what God designed us to be, He designed us to be curious. Let's put that a different way. He gave us a cultural mandate to both fill the earth, propagate, and to subdue creation. To to organize it. To organize it to use its resources to build and and to maybe you might want to use the word progress. What's wrong with coming up and and determining how to do cell phones? Not a thing. The problem is each new thing that comes about, sin begins to take over. Because it is the human nature to be curious, 
It is human nature to glorify God, to enjoy His creation. But the Tower of Babel revealed to us the result of creative creatures living under the curse. Because we began to see what happens with sinful human nature. Let's make a name for ourselves. Your pursuit becomes not about glorifying God, enjoying Him, appreciating what He's done for you. It becomes, let me use everything that I find and discover to glorify me. To fulfill my every want, my every passion, my every desire. And is that not the problem that roots that rears its head in every generation as society progresses forward? Take the Gospels. They were written as the Roman Empire progressed. This was ancient Rome. If you remember the story, they were started as a small little city, state, grew into a republic. Julius Caesar uh, ruined everything, if you might. <laughs> Formed the empire, we'll put it that way. Uh, and actually made them very powerful. And what they did was they became a melting pot of cultures. Does that sound familiar? They would go take over nations, and you get to keep your own culture, but then they began as Rome to... to pick off bits and pieces of the Greek culture and the things around them. Their growth led to crumbling political institutions. There was internal turmoil and violence. Does that seem to describe what we feel today? Internal turmoil to the the state of the United States and in our own selves. Uh, We see violence all around us, especially with the, the media picking up on these things. There was a growing gap between the rich and the poor. And government roles were limited to the aristocrats, the privileged classes, the wealthy. I mean, we're descri- you've, you've heard this before, the fall of Rome is the path that we're going to take as a nation. You begin to see that the Gospels were delivered into the midst of a world that had the same problems that we have. Different in the sense that the way they worked themselves out and the, and the, the nation they were in, and the, the, the level of and speed of communication has increased, but there were the same problems of mankind trying to make a name for themselves, calling and climbing over each other, battling, fighting, not seeking to glorify God. Our struggles, they are not new. The brothers and sisters, the Gospels, they're ancient yet relevant. They weren't new in that day, yet they were newly written, but the story and what they proclaimed was as old as time itself. Because these Gospels were delivered into ancient Rome. And and this was the world into which John the Baptist came proclaiming, I am the voice of one crying out in this wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. What is this voice crying in the wilderness? What is what is this about? It goes back to Isaiah chapter um, 40. I believe it was verse 3. And it's this story of, of it, it talks about bringing low the mountains and rise, raising up the valleys. And what it's saying is, Isaiah is proclaiming, flatten the land because there's a king coming. Prepare the way. One author said, said it the way I would have said it because I told my kids this the other day. It's like he's saying, roll out the red carpet because somebody fancies coming. Get out the fine china if you can find it. Clean it off. Because somebody important is coming to town. We need to make sure that the roads are clean, that they're clear. We're going to have a police escort. We're going to take care of this because John is announcing the coming of a king. John prepared the world for the coming king. 
said, prepare your hearts. And they all went out to John to be baptized. And they said, are you the Messiah? He said, no, I'm not the Messiah. But John was the one preparing for the coming of the king. Do, do you hear the repetition there? The coming of our king was coming. This was not God going, I think I'll go on down there. No, this was God from all of eternity past finally revealing to us what it was He was doing for us. A king was coming into the wilderness. The, the overgrown, uncultured, cursed place in which we live. Rome thought they were great. Do we not think we're great in America? We need a few things corrected, but man, we're really good. We're wealthy. We've got power. We think we're good. And John was going... Guys, this is the abyss. This is not as good as it gets. Prepare your hearts for the coming king. A king is coming into this wilderness. A king whose land had been subdued by an enemy. Think about the story that is both ancient yet relevant. God created. His creatures were perfect. They loved Him. They walked with Him. And then an enemy came in and gripped them and stole their hearts and said, don't you want to be God? And so that enemy, that ancient serpent, that, that wicked evil one overthrew in some sense. I mean, we know God can never be overthrown fully and completely, but he, 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 he subdued the earth. He did what we were supposed to do. And he subjected it to confusion, to destruction. And God said, I am coming. I am your king. My land has been taken. I am coming to get it. The God who promised he would lose none of his people. What did Jesus say? I will lose none of those the Father has given me. Who, did he, who was he given? He was given those who were children of the king. A king coming off of His throne to take back His possession. Think about that for a moment. We are God's possession. That's, that's our role in life. And He was coming with a very clear purpose to take us back. What is, how do we know this? He's coming to take back His land. He's coming to take back His people. And John says, I'm the one announcing this. And Jesus later on says, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've come to I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. Jesus' whole purpose was not to create a new religion, was not to create utter confusion in Israel. It was to save the world. It was to finish what God had promised He would do. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Jesus came to do what we could not do. Fulfill the law. To live the law perfectly on our behalf and then say, here, I've done it. This is yours. Take this and show it to God and you'll be allowed into heaven. He says, here, this is your perfection. Oh, by the way, give me your sin and I will take that. This is not a new message. It is a clarification of the role of Christ and the Messiah. The Gospels reveal to us this story of fulfillment. So I go back to the statement, the Gospels are progressive. They're not a new story. They are building upon the story of the Old Testament. They are building upon what God promised to do at the very beginning. The New Testament tells how our king came to fulfill his purpose. The New Testament and the Gospels tell a story of progress toward a goal. Fulfillment. And, and this is, you may go, okay, that, that's what, who cares? Why is that such a big deal? When we're walking through the valley of the shadow of death, like this, death has a shadow over this world. 
we experience all kinds of pains, struggles, little things from stubbing your toe, falling over and skinning your knee as a child, all the way up through terminal illnesses that last and, and plague us. And, and, and all the things in between and around, we deal with these regularly in consistency. One day you have it, the next day this person has it, and we're, we're, we're constantly dealing with struggles and pain. And we must know that this is not chaos and out of control, but that God is walking through history with a purpose. And the Gospels are the story, are a progressive story of how Jesus was foretold, He came, and then He's waiting to come back. That's what the stories of the New Testament are. And when we read the story of the New Testament, we need to read it through this lens of fulfillment so that we understand it's what it's talking about. We should not read it as new truth that had never come into the world. Because they needed it uh, years before. They, they needed this story of hope from a Savior that comes from God. And, it, and we are now privileged enough that we have it completely and fully. We have the whole story. And when we do, when we look at it and we go, that is a great story. And we set it on the shelf. And we forget about it. And then we encounter the, the world around us. It crushes us. But when we do what we talked about in Sunday school and we go, I'm coming back to this regularly and consistency, consistently because I believe it not to be an antiquated message, but an ancient truth that is, that is relevant to my life day in and day out, then it's transformative, it's helpful, it's encouraging, and it strengthens us. You often hear the phrase, history repeats itself. I read one time that that comes from, I believe it was the Greek notion that history is cyclical and it's really a never-ending train of you just keep repeating and going around and around. That was one theory of history. Uh, that's a false narrative. When you see things in history that look very similar to things in the past, like the Industrial Revolution, the first one created an upheaval in society in the same way that the technological revolution is creating an upheaval in society, what we really see is that rebellion follows similar patterns. It's always sinners taking new things and figuring out how to rebel more against God with those things. And it creates stress. It creates havoc. And so the church is constantly needing to go back to the Word of God to search its truth and say, God, how do I navigate this new thing that has come up that is creating the same havoc that they've experienced before. Rebellion against God always progresses away from God. Let me make a name for myself, just as they did in the Tower of Babel. But rather than history always repeating itself and being in this circular loop, we know that history is actually progressive and the Gospels are one part of the story of history saying there is an end goal. And it is all coming to a completion. And it is going to end in this world being refined by fire, being cleansed from its unrighteousness. And those of us who are covered in Christ, who have gotten in the ark with Noah, we might say, who are riding through the storms of this life in Christ, we will pass through that end point into a glorious eternity. But while we wait here, he says, do not neglect the stories of truth in the Scriptures because they're not antiquated to be put on the shelf and dust collected. They are very relevant to your lives. And if you don't understand how they're relevant, the problem's not the Scriptures. The problem is our understanding of the Scriptures. And don't give up because I will teach you more, he says. History has a specified end. He said it in Matthew 5.18, until all is accomplished. Jesus has a purpose. He will come again. He will bring an end to it. And we know that all of this is part of God's eternal plan. And here, here's, the, here's the beauty of, of something for us to realize is that your life, my life, our lives are all part of God's 
eternal plan realized in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You'll hear this all the time in Christianity, that God has a plan for my life. God has a purpose. And what we're really saying is God, from the beginning, has been working to take back the portion of His kingdom that Satan commandeered, to flush out the enemy. And John the Baptist is saying, the king just got off his throne and he's coming. Are you ready? Is your heart ready? Prepare the way for the king to come. And then the Gospels walk through that part of the story and say, here's the king. And then the book of Acts says, oh, by the way, he's gone. He came through. He destroyed the enemy. I'm going to leave you all here to clean up for a while, but then I'm going to come back because I do not leave anyone behind. You see, the gospel authors, they all include the story of John the Baptist. And I believe it's because it gives purpose to their story. The story of fulfillment. What they want us to understand first and foremost is this is not new good news. It is good news in the sense that what we've been proclaiming for years is actually true. Isn't it great when you have something that you're, you're kind of hoping happens, but you're not really sure it's going to happen, and then it happens, and you're like, yes, I knew it was going to happen when you really had no idea because you've been nervous for six months. Imagine being Israel, conquered all this land, we've been following, and then all of a sudden Jesus comes and they go, He's really here. Oh my. It's going to be just like the people that are living on earth when Christ returns. This is real. Like we know it, but this, this momentary astonishment that God's purpose is from all of eternity. I'm living in the midst of this coming to completion. Well, the reality is we may not see some big cataclysmic event occur during our lifetime, like Jesus returning or Jesus dying on the cross. But we are in the story. And the story is not just some random circle where we just keep running across crazy stuff. It's a progress towards an end goal where Jesus Christ comes, He takes back His kingdom finally, fully, and completely, gets rid of all those that would be destroying it, and welcomes us home to the promised land. Your life is a part of that story. The Gospel authors included John because it is an ancient story. It is not an antiquated, old-fashioned, outdated story. The Gospels tell the story of our King fulfilling His promise to leave none behind enemy lines. We recently had news stories of our government and our leaders, how they left people in uh, Afghanistan. And it, there was a, a big upheaval and an and uprising. Like, how could you do that? I, I don't know all the facts, but the, 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 the reality of leaving anyone behind is so ingrained in us that we would never do that because that's what our God has said to us. I will not leave you in the hands of the enemy. That's our hope. And that's what John was proclaiming. Your king is coming to save you. He himself is coming behind enemy lines. He's walking out and he's going to lay himself out to his own danger. He's coming to save you. And you even caused this problem yourselves. But he's coming to save you. The Gospels tell this story. They are an ancient story. They are relevant with lasting impact to today. The story is that we have been rescued by revolution. Jesus Christ has overthrown the serpent's kingdom. You see, our kingdom was divided. The people were scattered. The Gospels tell of our rescue. They tell that this Jesus, whom we have touched, we have walked with, we have talked with, John says, He's the Messiah. He is the chosen one 
of, of ancient Israel, the one they were waiting for, the one they were longing for. Brothers and sisters, our struggles are not new. They've taken on a new twist. They've taken on new technologies and ways they manifest to themselves. But our rebellion against God and how it always drives us into the ground is not new. But neither is the rescue plan. It is an ancient plan that's been, that began with eternity past and is going to go into eternity future. Because once we're rescued, we will never be lost again. Remember, the Gospels, ancient and yet relevant for your life today. Let's pray. Father, thank you for John who cried out, prepare the way for the King, make straight a path. We pray, God, that in our lives we would be preparing for Christ's return. We get caught up in, in just like in the days of Noah, like Scripture says, where we're eating and drinking and marrying and we're, we're not really thinking about you uh, very often. We forget that you're, 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 you're planning the day when you return to come and get us. Lord, help us to see in your Scriptures truth for living today. Let us not neglect them. Let us not turn away from them. And let us find great joy in them, we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.